Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to have my friend Ramon Penny on the show. And Ramon and I go back to 2000, I think 11, uh, when I first started visiting D.C. to visit my wife. Uh, Ramon invited me to some basketball events. And um, one of them, I know we had a chance to play with Obama. Obama didn't show up, but I went because <laughs> their chance was actually that he might show up and I might get to play with him. But uh, in this episode, we talk about Ramon you know, playing at a really good high school in Minneapolis before going to Mercersburg to do a postgrad year. And from there, he played at Florida State for a year before transferring to American. So we talk about postgrad year, all the benefits of that, um, playing at a high major level, transferring, transferring and playing at a low D1 level, kind of the differences there. Uh, we talk about his company, Pursuit Sports Group, and how they help athletes uh, on the financial side of sports. And uh, Andre Ingram, you know, that's one of his teammates from American University who um, was one of the all-time greats in the G League, who had a great little run with the Lakers. We talk about that. Uh, But my favorite part of the conversation is talking about his time of playing at the White House with the president, president's staff, and other uh, celebrities that came through. So uh, I really enjoyed this podcast. Uh, So please sit back and listen to the Prep Athletics Podcast with my friend, Ramon Penny. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Ramon, welcome to the podcast. Hey, what's up, Corey? Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to have uh, a good old time friend on here. And um, well, I want to start with your prep school experience. So you ended up going to Mercersburg for a post grad year, and I want to find out from your upbringing in Minnesota. You know, where did you first learn about prep schools? And once you learned about it, what made you decide on Mercersburg? That's a great question. And first and foremost, I want to say thank you again for having me. I appreciate this opportunity, and I know it's good for you, but also for others families and youth who are looking to go to prep school. So I want to make sure that I can answer some questions and just provide some light for others who are in a similar situation than I was, uh, that I had years ago. Um, So I learned about prep school when I was on college tours. Uh, I believe my junior year in high school, I was touring mid-major schools, low to mid-major D1s and uh, Ivy League schools. And when I was growing up, I had good grades in high school. However, I was never a great standardized test taker. And the schools that were recruiting me needed high SAT, ACT scores. So several of the schools that were recruiting me suggested, hey, you should go to prep school or boarding school to do an extra year for uh, academics and for your test uh, preparation. One. And then secondly, it's just another year to develop uh, physically and mentally. And me, I was a late bloomer, right? Um, I was a frail guy, you know, with long arms, always quick, but I need to put a little muscle on and and honestly learn the game a bit more. And so the coaches that are recruiting me were highly interested in me. And they thought that one extra year would set me up, would, would be a good foundation for me before going to college. And uh, I had a good mentor back home, Rex Holland. He was my coach and good family friend. And he agreed with that, even though it was a bit foreign uh, from someone in my neighborhood you know, with my background. However, uh, I will say one of my old high school friends was Larry Fitzgerald, who played for many years for the Cardinals. He did attend boarding school before I did. So he was kind of the first in my area, in my neighborhood. I, I believe he went to a military prep school, Hard, Hardgrave or Hardgrove. I can't remember the exact name. So he did it first. Um, and I and I kind of had an idea because of that. Uh, but that's how I heard about it is through college coaches. Gotcha. But then how did you find out about Mercersburg? That's a great question. The schools that are recruiting me, they suggested several schools. And Mercersburg is in the Maple Conference. Mm-hmm. And they suggested several schools in the Maple Conference because they have they worked with them before. And they knew about the program and coach Mark Cubitt, who was there at the time, he played at Syracuse and he had relationships with the coaches that I uh, knew. So you talked to probably a few prep school coaches and then did you visit or did you apply to multiple schools or tell me how you narrow that down, how you actually chose Mercersburg? Yeah, that's a great question. To be honest with you, I did not want to do it. I did not want to go to prep school and uh, especially like. It was foreign, like I said earlier, foreign to us and to my family. And the second part was I felt like it was a little embarrassing, right, to not go Mm -hmm. to college right after high school. What 
that just didn't make sense to me first and foremost. And uh, my parents didn't understand uh, what boarding school was and none of my friends did it either. So I really had to get over that hump first. Secondly, the coach at Mercersburg, uh, Mark Cubitt and the admissions, they said, hey, why don't you come out for a visit? You know, we'll we'll take care of you while you're here. You can stay here. We'll take care of your room and board. Just get out here and uh, we'll take care of you. So my mentor and I, we flew out. I was at least, that's, that's one thing about me. I was always open-minded and willing to say yes and try things. So I would recommend that to people. Just don't say no, even if you're not going to finally do it, just at least give it a shot and try it out uh, for a visit. And so that's what I did. I, I visited Mercersburg and uh, it was in the middle of nowhere. And I'm from the city, right? <laughs> Born in Chicago and raised in Minneapolis. So two pretty big cities. And uh, when I got out there, we landed at a small airport and uh, we had to get a rental car and drive to Mercersburg in the middle of nowhere. And great, I've never seen like so many cows and horses and fields in my life. So that was a little strange um, and surreal at the same time. And I did recognize that uh, and I was 17, 18 years old and I recognized that. And when I first got on the campus, my first thoughts were, wow, this place is beautiful. Mm -hmm. That just really blew me away even before I got out of the car. Yeah, because how would you know back then? Uh, it's just not as many people knew about prep schools back in your day, right? right? It's obviously taken off more now, but yeah, Mercersburg, beautiful campus. Fun facts, uh, Jimmy Stewart went there. Benicio del Toro, and I'm sure a lot more famous people as well. But I just like throwing out fun facts about people we all know who went to these places, oh, yeah. and, and so many more. Yeah, yeah. And then during that year that that you were at Mercersburg, how did you benefit from the post grad year? How did you develop as a player and a person? That is another great question, and honestly, I feel like it's one of the best places, institutions that I have been a part of, and I can call home, and I have a family there. I benefited because it helped me grow as a young man and into the man that I am now. Um, many reasons. One, uh, just getting away from home, right? Being on my own, you know, having responsibilities, being held accountable to make your bed, to shave, even though I'm not, <laughs> even though I don't have a clean face right now, but to uh, to shave, you don't either, no. uh, to shave and, uh, you know, to you know, prepare dinner or prepare the table for other people to wear button up in a blazer, uh, you know, to to attend an event, to speak an event, to speak in front of hundreds of other students and faculty. So you really learn so many different aspects of life. Uh, number one, two, the connections, right? Building yeah. relationships with people from all over the globe. I mean, I had friends from Kenya, India, Croatia, um, I mean, you name it. And I love that part about it because one of my hobbies is learning different languages. And so, you know, being at Mercersburg really helped me expand my knowledge in different cultures and languages. So that was fun. And then honestly, uh, the, the feeling that I got from Mercersburg was that, you know, if you come here and work, you truly can do whatever you want to do. If that's go play college basketball or football or swimming, whatever, if you want to be the president someday, like, Mercersburg and other prep schools, I believe, are the foundations. Like they have the setup to help you achieve your your lifelong goals, right? And so I felt that at Mercersburg. And and to be honest with you, the first several months I was there, I wasn't happy because mm -hmm. I didn't feel comfortable. You know, it, you know, it, you know, I'm used to being around a lot of African American males and uh, you know just a lot of basketball players, and I was just used to my routine in the city, and that was taken away from me. Um, but it was a new opportunity, and so I embraced that opportunity. And once I embraced that, I did have a break. I think when they when everyone got to go home for the holidays, I had one break, and uh, when I went home, I realized. I really like Mercersburg. And so I couldn't wait to get back. And so I got back and I didn't even need to go back home anymore after that. And uh, everyone just embraced me like I was family. And I really appreciated that. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and then after this year at Mercersburg, you ended up going to play for Leonard Hamilton That's at right. Florida State. Uh, right. Can you walk us through the process of how you ended up there? Yeah. So, you know, the craziest things happen in sports especially if you just, you know, put your best foot forward and you be honest with yourself and you, you know, just stay committed to the game. Right. And so that's what I did. I was honest with myself knowing that, you know, I probably was not a top 50 player in the nation. Right. So going to a mid major or a you know low major or Ivy league school was probably in my range. However, 
you know, working hard and, you know, building great relationships from uh, AAU basketball and sending out letters to coaches and my relationship with my coach at Mercersburg, Mark Cubitt, you know, he knew the type of person that I was and he also knew about my work ethic. And he had relationships with the Florida State coaches, uh, Leonard Hamilton, Stan Jones, um, and their other coaches as well. And when they voiced to him that they needed a backup point guard, backup, backup point guard, they voiced that to him. And I was actually invited as an invited walk on. Um, and uh, my mentor helped me get there as well. And, and we made that happen. Um, and even though I was being recruited by other schools, it was hard to turn down Florida State, right, to play in the one of the top basketball programs and conferences in the nation, ACC, right? Like playing against Duke and North Carolina, Wake Forest on television. And that year we were top 25, right? So it was hard to turn that down. And so we decided to to go there and uh, the rest is history. So you get there first couple of days of practice, high major. You're coming from a good high school in, in, um, in Minneapolis, a good post-grad year. You're ready to rock. But what did you notice in those first few weeks of practice that the high high major level had that you might not have been aware of before you got there? Athleticism. Okay. That was the very first thing. The athleticism was incredible, right? From the point guard to the center, everyone was jumping out of the gym. Everyone could run as fast as I could or faster, which I wasn't used to, right? Because mm-hmm. I was always the fastest on the team. Everyone had long arms, right? And so athleticism was the first thing and then secondly I vaguely remember the the other point guards on the team they were just so smart their basketball IQs were just off the charts and I really appreciated that because I come from D LaSalle right which Dave Thorson who's now one of the assistant coaches at Minnesota with the Gophers you know he's one he was one of the best coaches high school coaches in America and so I came from his program Right. And so seeing other players who understood the game, screen and rolls, and more importantly, defensive strategies, that was incredible to watch and see. And uh, so it was a learning lesson for me to be there. And it was an opportunity for me as well. I would always tell my mentor, I would always, always call him. And even though, you know, I wasn't getting playing time and would, you know, get scrap minutes, but I was always tell my mentor, I can play with these guys. I can play with these guys. I just need to keep practicing, keep working. And um, so that was my mindset the whole time, even if it wasn't true. It was my mindset. What was one of your highlights during that season that you'll always remember? Uh, one of my highlights, uh, one, just getting in the game, you know, having your name announced, you know, playing with, you know, a Florida State jersey and your name on the back. And, uh, you know, that was always fun. You know, my friends calling me saying that they saw me on ESPN, you know, even on on the bench or on the court for a few minutes. That was fun. Uh, another great memory was when we played against, I believe, North Carolina at home on ESPN and uh, Dick Vitale was calling the game. And before the game, he was like, there's no way Florida State's going to beat North Carolina. You know, and, uh, we we vaguely re- we remember that and um, uh, we knew that. And so that just added some fuel to the fire and we kicked their butts that game, man. I remember that. And so that was a lot of fun because they had a really good team. They may have even won it that year, but uh, mm-hmm. they had a really good team. So it was fun to uh, kind of disappoint Dick Vitale there. <laughs> so you did your year at Florida State, but then you ultimately, after that first season, transferred. Talk me through your mindset on why you wanted to transfer. It really wasn't my decision at first. I wanted to stay there. I wanted to keep fighting. Uh, however, my mindset shifted a little bit. I, I, my head was probably like a little bit in cloud nine, thinking that, oh, I'm playing for Florida State. We're in top 10. Uh, top 15 and uh you know if I keep working I'll be the man on this team or I'll make it you know so I had that mindset and then secondly my grades were slipping a little bit and again I had an incredible mentor and in Rexford Holland and he was he he recognized all that and he sat me down over the summer and he said hey um you know, I see your grades slipping a little bit and you're not playing as much, you know, you should probably attend a school where you can focus a little bit more and, and play. And he was right. Although I didn't want to hear that. And so we kind of bumped heads a little bit over the summer. And then we eventually, you know, had a conversation with the Florida state coaches and said, Hey, look, we love it here. However, we need a better fit for me. Right. And so they were great in helping us reach out to coaches and uh, the coaches that were recruiting me prior to Florida State, prior to Mercersburg, we reached out to them saying, hey, I had a successful year at Florida State and we're looking to transfer. And um, so we reached out and talked to Patriot League schools, Ivy League schools, and um, uh, 
one of the reasons I went to American University is because when I went to go visit several schools, it was in Washington, D.C. It's in Washington, D.C. And to be honest with you, when I visit Washington, D.C., I have a cousin that lives there and uh, who lived in Maryland and another cousin who was playing for Baltimore Ravens, uh, Terrell Suggs at the time. And so having that family base and another set of mentors um, were there for me and John Rice, um, whose daughter now plays at uh, UCLA. Uh, but so they were all there, one. And then two, I saw so many successful African-American males in Washington, D.C. And that just blew my mind because I didn't really see that in Chicago and didn't really see that in Minneapolis when I was there. And that made me feel like I want to go to Washington, D.C. and be a successful businessman and wear a suit and drive a nice car. So that was the that was more than basketball for me. Mm -hmm. right? And so it was making a life decision and no one really understood that but me. And that was OK. Uh, so that factored into my decision. And then secondly, I, you know, American promised a lot of things to me. And I'm not sure if they should have promised that to an 18, 19 year old, but they did. And I felt comfortable and I kind of got looped in and uh, I was ready to rock and roll. So I attended American University with Jeff Jones. Yeah. So in hindsight, going back to Florida State, you probably went in there as a walk on. And I'm assuming here, but you tell me if I'm right or wrong, that, hey, if I work hard and bust my butt, I'll earn my time. That's right. And I'm also assuming that after that first year, you realized, hey, no matter how hard I work, there are always going to be politics. There's always going to be recruited point guards ahead of me. Even if I work my butt off, outperform them. I still might not play in these four years. Was that something that you came to realization after you were already there? When I was at Florida State, yes. Yeah, and was I, that I the case? Because that's an assumption I'm making, Ramon. Right. Um, yeah, you're you're about right. Yeah, I mean, look, if you work hard, anything is possible. If you work hard and perform, yeah. So and yeah, so the mindset I had was yes. If I outwork some people, work hard, do what I have to do uh, on the court and off the court, yes, I'll earn that scholarship. But even before the scholarship, you have to build the relationship and earn the trust. Yeah. Trust that you're going to get great. Good grades. Trust that you're going to show up for all the team activities. Trust that you're going to take care of the ball. So that is the mindset first, like making sure that the coaches and your teammates can trust you, because if they can trust you in all those situations, you know, then anything is possible. Right. Yeah. And at the time, I didn't realize all of that, but I'm just saying now in hindsight, yeah. that's the mindset that you need to have, like build that trust on the court, off the court with your teammates and coaches makes sense makes sense so you played d1 at two different programs and you know most of the kids we talk to and mentor and work with want to play d1 right that's the ultimate goal it was your dream my dream and um so based on your experience playing d1 what was the best part of playing d1 and what was the worst part <laughs> the best part easy uh playing d1 right yeah. fulfilling that dream of playing division one basketball there's and then the secondly, uh, playing in the NCAA tournament, right? Oh, yeah. I, growing up as a kid, I felt like I always wanted to play in the NBA, but more importantly, I always wanted to play in March Madness. So I feel like that was my number one goal, you know? Uh, and so I achieved that at American University. You know, our my senior year, we won the Patriot League and we got to go to the big dance, played against Tennessee Vols. So that is the coolest thing in the world, right? being able to practice. And, and, and as a matter of fact, we were uh, the first team at American University to make it to the NCAA tournament in history. So that was fun. We were all over the newspapers and mm -hmm. people were cheering for us. I remember being on the subway on the Metro in DC and people were seeing me with my American University Eagles gear on and cheering and supporting. And we were in, on front of uh, many magazines and covers. And even at my barber shop, they were able to watch the game and cheer for us. So that was the best feeling in the world playing in the NCAA tournament. I love awesome. that. Awesome. And the, the worst part is, you know, not playing as much uh, one, not and that's different for everyone, but, and then two, not being able to experience everything that a normal college student can experience. Right. Like uh, even, you know, not going to a certain class or doing certain activities or studying abroad. Like I, I missed that. Um, what else? Uh, and then, when it's over, it's sad. You know, when your college career is over, that hurts. I remember, you know, and I, you know, I don't cry much, but I remember crying in that locker room after that NCAA game, like knowing that this is my last time playing college mm -hmm. basketball. So that was, that was tough. 
the quote I've always heard is only one team ends up ending the season, not crying, whether it's high school level, college. Yeah. Um, and, and one of my previous podcast guests, <laughs> Sasha Khan, um, he won a state high school title in Florida his senior year. He won a national NCAA title at Kansas his last game as a senior. And his last game in the NBA won a title with uh, LeBron and the Cavs. So oh he God. has never ended a career in tears. Crazy. Crazy, wow. man. Well, anyway, or tears of joy. <laughs> yeah, it's all tears of joy. All yeah. tears of joy. So that's uh, so that's a very small percentage of people who have done that. But uh, talk me through this. What are the biggest differences that you saw between a high major D1 program and a low major D1 program? Uh, Athleticism. You mentioned that earlier amongst the players. Definitely right? that. Uh, the first thing that sticks out to me is uh, the way you travel, right? Mm. Either – charter private jets or on the Greyhound bus or something like that. That's, that's a funny story. Cause I remember uh, at Florida state, we would have police escorts, most of the places we traveled to and, you know, traveling on a private team jet. So that was pretty fun. Uh, and then when we transferred to it, when I transferred to American, you know, and uh, it was time for a game and they're like, okay, we're getting on the bus. And I was like, okay, the bus to the airport, to the, to the team plane. And then they're like, oh, no, we're taking the bus all the way to Colgate. And I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> so I didn't realize that, but uh, that was one of the differences. And, the you know, the amount of gear you get, the type of gear you get. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, and just, you know, with the coaches, just different styles of coaching, you know. I think, you know, any coach at a college level, they're going to be a high quality coach right so just yeah. different levels and I was fortunate to play for a coach who also coached in the NBA right so my coach Leonard Hamilton you know coached the Washington Bullets or the Washington Wizards as we know them now uh, so that was a bonus right that was a huge bonus for me yeah everyone's playing the NBA and you got a guy like Calipari or Leonard Hamilton have actually been there they, they know exactly what those programs are looking for so I think that's such a valuable recruiting tool to have yeah. And then, and then the teams you play against, right. So, you know, we were playing against Duke, right. North Carolina, Wake Forest with Chris Paul there, you know, so the competition level was so fun. I loved it. Yeah. I'm going to go back in time and talk about our first meeting. Um, Great. And, and our connection is my wife, Josie, and she met you doing a project. Um, and then, you know, I started dating her and started coming to v DC to visit her. And right. one time she said, you got to hook up with Ramon. Um, yeah. One of these weekends, you're going to come up. He gets together at 6 a.m. on Saturday mornings. And sometimes <laughs> President Obama shows up at those uh, events. And I haven't played. I didn't play ball in like four years. And I was like, well, shoot, I better get some shoes, better get in shape. <laughs> That's right. And, and I joined you for one of these 6 a.m. sessions and Obama didn't show up. But there were former pros out there. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And I got thrown into the gauntlet, met you there for the first time. Yep. And uh, since then, when I moved to D.C., one of the first things you invited me to do was to play um, at the Verizon Center against the WNBA team, the Mystics, in a practice. And I said, Ramon, I I've not once again, I've not played in a while. You want me to play against pro females? And it turns out we did fine. Um, it was it was good to see the level of play that was. But uh, you really, we really hung around the D.C. scene and the basketball scene there, and you introduced me to a lot of people within the community. And I just appreciate that. But tell me, um, tell me how you started getting into the DC community, the basketball community and start associating with, with these pros and, and, and other guys in these morning runs. Yeah. And I'm sorry, there's some noise in the background. So hopefully you can still hear me clearly. Can't even hear it. We're well, great. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, that is how we met uh, through your wife. We were shooting a commercial uh, and uh, she introduced us and yeah, I invited you out right away when they said you played basketball as well, division one basketball at air force. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had to see if you had any game, man. Uh, but so there were a few runs that we had. One, the run you were talking about at 5, 6 a.m., that was a run led by a good friend of mine, Arthur Jackson, who runs one-on-one -on -one basketball in Washington, D.C., and he also played Division I basketball at Brown University. And my other mentor, who I mentioned earlier in this conversation, John Rice, he assisted Arthur with putting that run together. And John also played Division I basketball. He played at Yale and uh, those guys grew up in D.C. and, you know, they were just so connected in the basketball world there. And John's uh, sister, Susan Rice, you know, who mm -hmm. works in the administration and works with, worked for the Obama administration. Um, so there were just so many connections, so many ties there. And Arthur had a relationship with Obama as well. And so through those relationships, um, we were invited to play with President Obama, uh, you know, when he was first inaugurated uh, to the White House. And so we would go and play um, sometimes at the White House, but mostly we would play at Fort 
uh, you know, at uh, military bases uh, uh, in the surrounding areas, and sometimes at Camp David, uh, which was incredible and once in a lifetime experience. And uh, we built a great uh, family circle um, for the president, so he could not always focus on politics, but sometimes just have an outlet to to get away from that. And so we did that throughout his presidency. And what an honor. Uh, to do and to be a part of and involved with. And so we have that family of what, you know, 12 guys who did that for eight years. And uh, we'll never forget that and be able to share stories and the pictures with my family and friends. And uh, so that was an incredible experience. But walk me through this logistics here. So when the president, when President Obama wants you to play basketball with him, you, you get a phone call. Walk me through the logistics. How do they call you? How do you know where to go? What's your clearance you have to get? Like, and when you yeah. show up there, like, you don't know who's going to be there on a day-to-day basis, right? So walk me through that uh, whole process. Well, uh, you know, is C-14 classified, so I can't tell you everything? Just <laughs> no. give me the basics. You get yeah, a phone no, but, call. But, yeah, but basically you get, you know, you know, a few nights before, you know, from probably, you know, uh, at the time, you know, Reggie Love, who is the president's personal assistant, uh, that, hey, look, we're going to, you know, we're on for the weekend. It's usually, we usually play Saturdays or Sundays, mostly <laughs> every Sunday. Um, and, you know, you get a message or a call from Reggie. And then, you know, the first several times you would have to get clearance through the White House. And so you would get a call and they'd have to do a back- background check and, you know, who, who knows what else they did. Uh, but yeah, you, you definitely have to get cleared to do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, you would, you know, once we knew that it was regular, we would clear our schedule. And it was interesting for me because at the time, I was working for Ernst and Young and it was busy season most of the time when I was there. So it was interesting because the partners had to let me go and do this and other staff didn't understand how come he gets off, you know? And uh, so that was pretty cool to do that and get away, get out of busy season to go play basketball with the president. Um, But yeah, so you had to do background check. And then once you got there, he has to search you, make sure that you didn't have anything on you or, you know, but once it became regular, you know, we were pretty, cool to get through with the White House and uh, security. Uh, But obviously, you know, there are some situations there that they had to make sure that, you know, we are who we are. And, um, you know, there was one situation where the president got hurt one time. And so security was really tight. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that. You can do some research on that. But um, that was the only issue that we've ever had. uh, But it turned out to be all right. And did you ever show up and there was like good basketball players there, like pop ins. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, I wasn't there all the time um, because I had to travel sometimes. Uh, but, you know, through those runs, I believe like Kobe Bryant came through those runs. With I remember, you? Um, I, I don't believe I was there okay. with Kobe Bryant that time, but definitely with Kevin Durant, James Harden, you know, Russell Westbrook, I believe, you know, a lot of NBA players would come and play with us sometimes. Chris Duhon, who I also remember playing in college. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, the guys that we played with on a regular basis, they all played collegiately or professionally. Right. So they were first class runs. Right. Um, But yeah, the president would would invite people out uh, uh, for his birthday on special runs. Um, So that was, that happened pretty regularly. Cool. And then you had, so your relationship with Obama also, you did some training as well, right? We, um, Yeah, I mean, we we built a great relationship, right, with him and his family and, you know, folks in the administration. Um, And honestly, one of my best friends today and closest friends and supporters is Arnie Duncan, Mm -hmm. um, who's former Secretary of Education, right? And so Arnie and I are pretty close. Our families are pretty close. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, like I said earlier, Arthur Jackson, who ran one-on-one basketball training, I did some consulting for him and worked with him. I did that when I was in college and a little after college. And, you know, he would regularly train the Obama daughters. And so I would show up and assist sometimes. So, uh, yeah, so we would do that. And, uh, yeah, it was fun, man. It was, it was a great time. What what a unique experience, Ramon. I mean, not, not many people can say, um, <laughs> they did that. Some of your Florida state teammates that you played behind did not probably have the privilege to do that. So everything always works out. That's right. Um, tell me about the pursuit sports group that you run. Yeah. Tell me about your company and, and what you guys do for athletes. Thank you so much for asking. We are a pretty unique company, I believe, because we don't fit in one box, right? And I, I started this company, as I said, I was at Ernst & Young earlier. You know, I have a tax background. I have a degree in accounting from American University, Kogah School of Business. And uh, throughout the summers, I would always have internships 
Um, I did an internship with ESPN in the finance and accounting department. I interned with Ernst & Young uh, throughout uh, the summers. And I was fortunate enough to get an offer from Ernst & Young. And I, I loved it there. I learned so much there, built great relationships with other staff and partners. However, I always knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. number one, because like I said, my mentors were entrepreneurs, John Rice and Rexford Holland, excuse me. And uh, I, I wanted to do something around sports and business. And I just merged my two passions together and I created Pursuit Sports Group. And I remember reading an article in the newspaper, I believe in the Washington Post, Sheila Johnson, um, who's part owner, minority owner of, I believe the uh, Washington Wizards and the um, Mystics. She said, uh, you know, many athletes do not have a plan for when they retire. And uh, she was talking about one of her athletes who did have a plan and that was Elena Beard. And she was playing for the Washington Mystics at the time. And I had a relationship with uh, Elena because I worked with their team. As you mentioned, I helped their team out, did some consulting for their team. And when I read that article, it just really stood out to me. And I wanted to do something with athletes because they didn't have a plan, one. And then two, around that time, there were also articles in Sports Illustrated. I believe Pablo Torre from ESPN did an article on athletes filing for bankruptcy and not protecting their money and protecting their wealth. And so I thought, well, I have a background in accounting. And I love sports and I want to assist these athletes. And so I want to create a company that can kind of create a foundation to help athletes understand, right, through financial education to make prudent financial decisions, right? And so I created Pursuit Sports Group uh, with financial education being the foundation of everything that we do. And at the end, helping athletes develop strategies to help them further develop, maintain, and grow their wealth. And that comes in many different ways, right? Most people, when you think about that, it's, hey, let's invest in the stock market or get a financial advisor. And that's one way, and that's a great way. However, there's so many different ways, especially with um, professional athletes, right? You know, they can invest in real estate. They can invest in their own business. Uh, they can invest by, you know, doing speaking engagements or creating product products, shirts, and hats. Um, they can be in movies and commercials. So there's so many different ways for athletes. And so we just want to help them tap into all those different opportunities, right? So we start off doing that with professional athletes. And then while we're building our financial education program called the Pay Yourself First program, which we were guided by the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, through our relationships there. And also with the assistance of Arnie Duncan, who was at the Department of Education at the time, we create this program, not only for professional athletes, but also for college athletes, right? Because we realize if you can learn about financial education when you're in college, hopefully you can make better decisions when you become a pro. Right. And not to be cliche, no matter if you're a pro in college or a pro in something else in, in life. And so we started this program way before NIL, name, image, and likeness was around. So we were ahead of the game, ahead of the curve. And so we start implementing this program starting at the University of Maryland and then, you know, building that, uh, you know, with the other relationships that we built. Right. I had relationships with USA Basketball, uh, Gino Ariema, who's at UConn, um, who's a great coach. Uh, we built relations with him. And so we got our program at their school. And then so we just continue to roll that program out at different schools. And now it's rolling it all over the place for different teams and uh, we're having a blast and those kids are making money now through name image and likeness deals and we're doing our best to assist them perfect so that's for the college side what about the pro side tell me what you do there yeah, so so with the pro same side, thing similar things right yeah. so the financial education piece you know wealth strategy consulting and uh you know assisting them with deals and contracts and and wealth and uh investment opportunities yes gotcha so so so, so we're a financial strategy consulting firm Gotcha. Okay. And you would work in conjunction with their agents then or? Yeah, sometimes okay. we do work in conjunction with their agents. Not all players have agents. Sometimes we work with agents and uh, their business advisors. And sometimes we serve as business advisors. So, you know, so, you know, we kind of do a little bit of everything. So some players don't have agents. I, di I didn't know that. I thought every player had an agent. No, no, not necessarily. Sometimes players want to represent themselves. Some players uh, have business managers that assist them. And, uh, you know, so, so it's case by case. Let me ask this. This is me not knowing that world that well, but if I'm a player, right, even if I'm very well educated, wouldn't in theory, I want an, an agent who knows this landscape and knows how the, the deals can work and know all the advantages they can get from, from contacts that the agent might have that the player might, 
What's that's the pros and great, cons of that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Possibly, you know, maybe when you're first starting out, possibly yes, uh-huh. right? Because you need guidance. Uh, and it depends how much your family is involved. Um, who are some of your mentors? Who is your circle? Maybe you have a strong circle of folks who, who have done this. Maybe you know people who are lawyers or business managers and successful and they understand just how the game works, right? And they have great relationships. Maybe you're a top five player and deals are coming your way with or without an agent, right? So some people want to save money, right? Because you have to pay a a fee to your agent, right? Maybe you want to save money and earn more money for yourself. Maybe you want to have an agent as just a consultant Mm -hmm. um, and you just pay them for certain work that they do. And so there's pros and cons each way. I'm not saying it's better to have or to not have. Uh, I'm just saying everyone is different. It's case by case. And LeBron, he had he he promoted Maverick to his agent. Was that all along, or was that something he did after a few years of having an agent? I, and you know, don't quote me on this, but I believe LeBron did start out with an agent. Okay. And he, you know, he was so great to have his close friends involved, and you know, they they learned from his agent, and so eventually, you know, once they got to a position uh, and uh, a level to understand how how the game works. You know, I believe that he switched to allow his friends to be his full-time agent, which Perfect. turned out well. <laughs> yeah, and just a personal note on that. So, obviously, we've talked about my cousin, Brad Miller, who played in right. the NBA for 14 years. Right, I remember meeting him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my dad and uncle kind of managed him, right? Uh, right. And my dad played pro for a year. Um, his brother got drafted. He's a businessman. Yeah. And we met – I actually was on this trip because Brad was playing um, in the NCAA tournament in Chicago. and. My father and I went, um, I think I was 20 years old at the time, uh, to watch March Madness. But we also popped into Mark Bert- Bartlestein's office, who yeah. uh, was headquartered in Chicago. And, you know, he had a history of kind of representing um, underutilized big centers. And I think some of his famous clients were Kurt Warner, Ron Artest, Evan Esch. He got like Evan Eschmeyer, I think a $50 million contract. And my dad knew like, hey, this guy's in this industry he gets way bigger contracts for people than they they should get. Um, let's let's rely on him. He'll be worth the percentage. And over the course of Brad's career, Brad got ninety million dollars just to play. Right? Um, no way us as a family could have helped with that. We needed Mark Bartlestein's, you know, connections to agencies. I'm just giving a personal story here of how we felt about it when making that decision. And I just. You know, not that this conversation needs to be able to get about agents, but, you know, the last guy on the podcast was an agent, uh, Kevin Tarker, that we had on here. But um, it, it's interesting. I just never thought a player would want to go into these high pressure situations with a lot of money on the line on their own, you know, or with a family member. Even if a family member's got business acumen, it just seems like you want to be with someone that does that on a daily basis with the same execs. But that's just right. my and, thoughts, Ramon. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and thank you for sharing that. And, you know, nine times out of 10, you probably do want to have <laughs> right. an agent in a team, right? I, I, so I don't want to, you know, you know, suggest or promote that. I'm just saying it's case by case. Yeah. Right? And uh, also when you, you're talking about money, right? You know, the agent doesn't necessarily take care of the money, right? That's a financial advisor or that's a tax accountant, right? Uh, and so again, with or without an agent, you're probably going to need a little guidance around that unless Unless your family, again, has built some wealth and they understand finances. So, again, you want to build a great team around you as consultants or as full time, you know, staff. So, yeah, my 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 concern would be if I was a big time player, like how would I pick the right agent and how would I pick the right financial team? Like there's got there's gonna be so much trust there because you hear so many bad stories that happen out there, even guys like Tim Duncan get millions taken um because they made the wrong choice so i think yeah you know it's, it's a problem i don't have to worry about but i just i just wonder how uh these big time athletes do that yeah and that's a whole nother podcast probably. i know, but, I know. Uh, but we know, talked about that in the last one with the agent he's yeah, like hey yeah. you just got to do your due diligence and that's what i was gonna good. say due diligence something that um like my motto is uh the tie motto that i just thought of is um trust integrity and effort right so when you're dealing with anyone are they putting in, you know, are, do you have trust with them? You know, do they have integrity and are they putting in the right amount of effort? So, yeah. you know, trust, integrity, effort. So I would look at that for anyone that you're dealing with and um, do your research, do your due diligence, ask questions, shop around, you know, just like if you're going to go buy a new car, you should look at two or three dealerships and the same thing with your team, you know, look at two or three different agents. 
two or three different financial advisors and accountants. So yeah, absolutely. Now, one of your uh, clients that got a lot of pub in the past couple of years is Andre Ingram. (laughs) Can you tell me about Andre's background and then when the blow up happened and and how you were involved? That's interesting. I was just texting with him yesterday. Uh, He is first and foremost, an incredible, incredible person. He is like a brother to me and he is just inspiring to so many people in so many ways. Andre Ingram, for the folks who do not know his story, is originally from Richmond. Uh, We played together at American University. I obviously wasn't there when he first got there because I was at Florida State, but we did have a chance to play together for a few years. And um, we would always practice together before and after practice. So that was fun. We had great competitions and we just hung out on the court and after and after uh after practice off the court and Andre went to go play in the G League uh after college and uh you know he you know he did well right he was a big time three point shooter i believe right now he has the most three pointers made ever in G League history he's played the most games ever in G League history and he has the highest shooting percentage in G League history i believe it's even higher than Steph Curry's percentage in the NBA right high 40s so uh, you might have to check that. Um, but yeah, so anyways, uh, doing that, he stuck it out and he played, I believe he started with the Utah uh, G League team and uh, he was traded uh, to the Lakers G League team. And that was incredible because he turned it up. And, um, but even I, I believe between there, he uh, he played in two, I believe, three-point shooting competitions in the G League and he beat Jimmer Fredette. Um, oh, wow. and, uh, yeah. Right. And Jimmer is a big time three point shooter. So Dre did that. So he was gaining uh, a lot of recognition and publicity. And we were representing him at the time um, for business management uh, services. And we did some financial consulting for him as well. And um, so we were we were close and uh, we still are close. And uh, Dre continued to develop on the court and get better which was crazy. I don't know how could you get so much better. And so he did um, from a three point percentage standpoint. And he was fortunate enough when Magic Johnson um, took over the Lakers, he was fortunate enough to get a call up from Magic and Rob Palenka. And it was just fun to be involved with that experience as his brother and business manager. And, you know, him calling me right away saying Magic Johnson and Rob Palenka called him to the office and they had this special announcement for him that he'd be called up to the Los Angeles Lakers. And, I loved it because it meant so much for him and his family. It meant so much for him from a financial standpoint and people acknowledging his greatness mm-hmm. on the court and just him as a person. If anyone deserved that opportunity, it's Andre Ingram. And I remember when Kobe Bryant, you know, said an amazing quote about Andre saying, this guy is incredible. We're so happy and thrilled to have him a part of the Lakers family, right? It doesn't get any better than that. And then him being teammates with LeBron James, uh, which was fortuitous because another one of our teammates, who is Sekou Lewis, who is now the general counsel for Dallas Mavericks, he played in high school with LeBron James. And when I was in high school, I played against LeBron James. So we all had this connection um, through basketball to LeBron James, and uh, which was pretty cool. And so Andre's first game, you know, I can go on and on about this, but Andre's first game, he played against Houston Rockets and... James Harden was guarding him and he lit him up and he lit the team up. I'm not sure if James guarded him the whole game, but he lit the team up for 18 points in his first game ever as a Los Angeles Laker, which was the highest ever. He even beat Kobe Bryant's first you know, amount of points as a rookie. So he blew up and one thing led to another and got publicity all over the place. So that was so fun. And I'll wrap up and say that, um, you know, we even got – called to uh, do the first pitch at a Los Angeles Dodgers game. So I got Yeesh. to be involved with that. Yeah. So, and be on the field for that. So I'll have to show you pictures another time. So he got, did he get caught up for a 10 day contract or how did that work? He, he uh, what was it? It was at the end of the season, right? Yeah. I can't remember the first call up was a 10 day or not, but it doesn't matter. It was a call up. I believe it was a 10 day. And so he did that. He, he had a several of those call ups, you know, 10 day call up once and twice. And, um, Man, he he the first time he definitely performed well. And I know the second time around, I don't think he performed to the level that he know he could have. So um, so I, I believe he was up and down uh, that at that time. But uh, he's still rocking and rolling. And then he also became the president of the uh, G League Players Association. Um, so he's currently doing that. And um, right now he's ready to get back on the court, ready to rock and roll. Where's he at now? 
So he was back home in Richmond healing. He had uh, he had uh, some health issues he had to deal with. And then he had a family issue he had to deal with. So he's going to play. He's still going to go. I mean, he's like Tom Brady and LeBron James. This guy's ready to go. Is he going to G League or actually to the to the league? That's a great question. So he'll be with the G League again. He's missed some time uh, with the NBA, with basketball in general. And so we'll see what happens. I don't know if you know this or not. So if you don't know, no big deal. But when you get like a 10 day contract, it, what what's what do players get paid for 10 days? Yeah. Uh, so so it varies um, what they get paid, uh, but definitely a lot more than uh, yeah. what, what he was getting paid in the G League. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't want to go exactly over all the numbers, but, you know, he, it, it, you, you get paid more, number one and then yeah. two. You get it's just a better situation, right? So you're traveling with the NBA team, you get stipend, and you know you're getting put better hotel situation. So just not just the money, but the whole situation is better. Yeah, the absolutely. Locker room, the playing, being on TV, you know, all of that, the whole nine. So um it's just better all around. What's the minimum for a one year player? Do you know what's the minimum contract? It's like 1.5 nowadays for one year. Yeah, you know, so it's in that range. Yeah. So for a ten day, would they just take eighty two games divided by one? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, okay, so okay. The, yeah, so so it's a so it prorated amount. Okay, yeah. okay, cool. I, that's just there's a lot of details and all that that I just I'm not aware of yet, and not that people uh, want to know about prep schools <laughs> need to know those details because I'm sure there's hey, other podcasts, yeah, yeah, but maybe. it's just uh, it's interesting how that can just ten days can just be just a flush of cash. Um, we're gonna do some quick hitters here, all right? Sure. Who's the best player you've ever guarded in a game? LeBron James. Oh, geez. Okay. Was that in high school? It was in high school. Okay. It was it was in high school, but it was um AAU basketball. We played in Chicago. Okay. And I believe it was called the Mac Irv tournament. We played at a high school called Julian High School. It was so cool because my my dad got to come. He lives in Chicago. And uh man, that was that was so fun. And you know, and I didn't guard him the whole game, right? I guard him several possessions because no one on our team could guard him. So everyone had a chance to guard him. <laughs> so, so that was pretty fun. What was the, I, mean, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway, what's the biggest win of your career? Biggest win? Team win? Yeah. Definitely. Patriot League championship? Of course. Yeah. Right? Okay. Go to the NCAA tournament. Yeah. So, okay. Hands down. Uh, what are your hobbies when you're not doing what you do full time? I love that question. Uh, learning different languages. Mm -hmm. uh, I love playing basketball still. I mean, playing all types of sports. Uh, pickleball is one of my favorite sports now. And a, a new sport called fireball. Uh, so playing that, which is kind of like a variation of like handball and soccer mixed together. So uh, doing that, uh, you know, watching movies, traveling. I love traveling to different mm -hmm. countries. Um, you know, just hanging out with friends, listening to different music uh what else and now uh as you may know as we discussed recently i'm getting into the entertainment world yeah and so i'm you know when i was younger i was into theater and so i'm now kind of getting back into that and so i'm doing some acting now so i've been in some short films and hopefully that will continue to grow so just really living the dream having fun and just doing trying new things and having fun like as you know we may be skiing soon together so i'm you know, trying skiing and snowboarding you know which it's also foreign to me, but I'm going to give it a shot. So, yeah, you know. I know you guys can't tell watching this or listening, but Ramon's about 40 miles that way uh, down the hill <laughs> outside of Denver right now. And uh, I'm trying to get him to go to the mountains during his trip here uh, after he sees Josie and I uh, to go learn snowboarding. And that'll be, I think, if he does it right and likes it, that'll be one of his new hobbies. So, and, right, and Ramon right. likes traveling too. Like, he and I have traveled to Maine before to check on a prospect. Uh, we've traveled to Minneapolis before to, to see some NBA stuff. And he, he showed me around uh, his neighborhoods in Minneapolis. So we have traveled quite a bit. And uh, now I'm glad that he's going to be in Denver more often. But uh, last question of the quick hitters, which, you know, you mentioned you like watching movies. What's your favorite movie of all time? Ooh, great question. Or, or top three. I know it's a tough one, right? Yeah. My, my, my go to are, you know, I'm an old Western guy, man. I love old Western movies and shows. So I would have to say my 1A, 1B is a Tombstone with Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday. Oh, man, I love that movie. And uh, so I watch that movie regularly. And then two, I love Denzel Washington. Like, who doesn't? And uh, so my one of my favorite movies with him is Inside Man. Oh, um, yeah. I love so many of his movies. Um, great debaters. You know, I mean, I can keep going. But those are probably my top two. Uh, um. 
I also like uh, Gladiator. That's a great movie and Braveheart with Mel Gibson. But so um, I can keep going. Perfect. You know, I saw Tombstone in high school on a date and it was like Friday night when it came out packed and the guy behind me was on, on acid and he let everyone know. He's like, this, this movie is the, it's freaking me out, man. And so all, all of Tombstone, I got a guy high, which that'd be a weird movie to see on acid. I think, it, you know, if I was going to do that, I'd want to see something a little bit more colorful, but oh, shoot, all the one lighters that came out of that and all the colors, maybe it was perfect. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. We've done a lot of chat in the day. Remember, is there anything we have not touched on? You think we should, uh, we should talk about them. I, I just want to say for the folks out there who listen to this podcast, who especially the families and the students who are, are interested in attending a prep school or boarding school is to one, take a deep look at it, visit the schools. And, you know, lastly, if you have an opportunity to speak with someone like Corey, and I know Corey doesn't really want to promote himself uh, right now, but if you have an opportunity to speak with Corey or someone who does something like Corey, and there's not many people who, who do what he does, um, reach out to Corey via email or on social or, or call him if you can, and just talk about the process, you know, of enrolling in a prep school, the pros and cons, because Corey has relationships with many prep schools all over the globe. He's worked with so many different student athletes, male and female in different sports, but mainly basketball. And he's going to be honest with you and real with you. And he's not just going to just place you at a school because he has a relationship with the school, right? He's going to get to know you and your family and figure out what is a best fit for you and that school. And he will never lead you in the wrong direction. So you have some guidance. You don't have to do it alone. So reach out to Corey at Prep Athletics if possible. Thank you very That's much right. for that kind word. Yeah, Ramon and I, just so you guys have known, we've worked on multiple players over the years. Right. And um, he, we had one this last week just committed to Princeton. We're very happy about that. Yep, um, yep. My uh, good friend, Arnie Duncan's son, uh, Ryan Duncan, who is going to uh, attend uh, Princeton and play basketball there. Corey and Prep Athletics assisted uh, the Duncan family. So thank you for that. Yeah, and yeah, you're welcome. And uh, Ryan ended up choosing Wilbraham and Monson. So he's there right now right. Uh, playing with Coach Mike Mannix, having a great experience. But yeah. um, yeah, anybody out there, you know, I will look at your profile, answer any questions you have. Uh, yeah. Doesn't mean you're the right fit for prep school. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm very blunt with that, but I'll at least let you know if it is an option or not. And if you do qualify and you're a player that a prep school would want, let's narrow down all those prep schools down there and find you the right fitting ones to talk to. Just like Ramon's, you know, the college coaches he talked to, you know, multiple ones told him about Mercersburg. You right. need someone that knows this industry to help you navigate it, right? I can't imagine trying to figure out what the right fitting prep school would be for my situation. That's where I can help you with that. Right. And any, I'll talk to anybody. So just feel free to reach out. All my information is at prepathletics.com. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to me on all the major podcasting platforms, subscribe on YouTube. We have bonus videos on there. A lot of great content. You can see me do the podcast versus just listening if you want to. And um, sign up for the newsletter at prepathletics.com so you don't miss anything there. And like I said, feel free to reach out to me whenever, wherever. Uh, more than happy to help. And all the information, the pros and cons, anything you need, need to know about prep school is on the website, right? Everything is there. If you need more details, um, I'll be happy to help you. But um, that was this week's episode. So, Ramon, thank you very much for joining me, old friend. It's good to have you my on. Pleasure, here my pleasure, my friend. Yeah, look forward to seeing you soon. Look forward to seeing you soon. Absolutely. We'll be having lunch hopefully on Monday here. <laughs> yep. And um, yeah, thank you all for tuning or tuning into the Prep Athletics podcast. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you.